Mr. Mellon, I, I was I was a little confused, um, and I'm, I'm sure it's um, me not following very very well uh, some of your submissions before the short adjournment. And I just want to be clear what what this jurisdiction question is all about is whether the taxpayer can appeal the revenues decision to exercise a 7A power. Yes. And, and there's nothing in 7A, unlike 4, to, uh, 684, subsection 4, about appeal. That's right, yes. So, so you have to find a way in. And the, the provisions you were focusing on before lunch were the collection mechanism provisions rather than the assessment provisions. Because regulations... 185 and 188 are about collection, aren't they? They're, they're about what is what is to be paid or what the revenue can collect from the taxpayer. Whereas sections eight, nine, section twenty nine, um, the, the the various provisions that that require an amendment to be made to the self assessment following a closure notice to give effect to the inspector's conclusions as stated in the closure notice, all of those are to do with assessment. Well, my lady... So that, that's what was confusing me, okay. but, are you, but presumably you're going to come to that. Yeah, well, I think perhaps if I can deal with the 68478A point yeah. first um, and why this all feeds into that, because I can see that we're looking at one provision and then separately we seem to be focusing on a whole series of others about... PAUIE credits. Um, the point there, um, and I, I think it's a point, uh, my lady, which you put quite neatly in your decision in Beadle, um, is that, if I can just find it, and It's at tab 47 of the bundle. And this is obviously just the introduction, but I think it, it neatly encompasses the statement of the law. Sorry, tab? Tab 47, and we want to look at paragraph 4 on page Down the paragraph. Furthermore, the FTT is a statutory tribunal, and, and sorry, paragraph four, and has no inherent jurisdiction nor any jurisdiction to grant judicial review. However, that does not mean that the FTT never has jurisdiction to determine public law questions. A tribunal has, that has no ju judicial review jurisdiction may nevertheless have to decide questions of public law in the course of exercising the jurisdiction which it does have. So. What we say is that the tax tribunals have jurisdiction to determine the amount of tax payable, the amount of the obligation to pay tax of any taxpayer. So the amount, the amount of tax payable? Yes. The, the thing which Lord Brian Wilkinson was talking about the amount which the taxpayer has to reach into his pocket for. The amount of tax payable, yes. Yeah. Now, in this case, the amount of tax payable will depend upon the lawful exercise of the revenues discretionary power in section 68487A. So, if there has been a lawful exercise of that discretion, taxpayer doesn't get the benefit of amounts which should have been accounted for to the revenue. If there hasn't been a lawful exercise of that discretion, the taxpayer does get the benefit of that, and the amount of tax payable is different. 
So in order to address that question, how much tax is payable, the tribunal will need to engage with the legality of the exercise of the discretion. Now, if the tribunal can't address entitlement to, basically as part of the amount taxable, that tax credit, then it seems to follow that exercising a discretion to remove it isn't something which falls within its jurisdiction. And so the way in which the upper tribunal addressed the matter was it said there was no jurisdiction to address this question of what is payable. <coughs> And therefore, it follows from that there's no jurisdiction to address 6847A. Now, as to the second aspect of that, I think we have to accept that must be right. If the tribunal, there's no general ju judicial review jurisdiction, it's only if that public law question arises in the context of something which the tribunal does have power to decide, here they might payable that it arises. So, so that's, <coughs> I hope, a bit clearer in terms of how it fits together. So th that is why we've been focusing on the amount of tax payable, because we say the tribunal does have the jurisdiction in terms of assessments to work out what the amount of tax payable is. The amount of tax payable depends in part on how regulation 188 applies. And bearing in mind, regulation 188 is directly addressed to assessments. It, it's not addressed to collection of tax. Regulation 188 is addressed to self assessments other than self assessments. Is that right? Well, I think we can we can have a look at it. it it's entitled assessments other than self assessments, and and this was my point about um, sorry, it, it's tab four, page three hundred twenty five of the legislation. Paper. to assessments, but it isn't about the assessment and what is uh, what is to be assessed. It's about what is payable, isn't it? Uh, my, my lady, th this was very much the point of taking you to both um, Hampshire and Archer. There are two aspects of an assessment, um, the amount on which a person is liable and the amount of tax payable. And just pausing there, so the, as to liability, that's, there's no dispute that the contractors are liable to tax on their earnings now. Uh, yeah, the that, that's been conceded, yes. Right. Okay, so, so that's the first aspect, and that's what sections 8, 9, 29 are all directed at, um, well, assessing that liability. That's one of the things section 8 is directed at. As I'll take you to in a moment, there are two aspects to an assessment under Section 8. One is chargeability, and one, the other is the amount payable. Right. And the point in Hallamshire was that an assessment has to show the amount payable. It's not enough to show the amount of income tax chargeable to tax. And what Regulation 188 is directed towards is the tax payable. And it, it, it says much as much in clear terms, 
paragraph two, the tax payable by the employee is. And so while that does relate to collection, I, in a sense, they're two sides of one coin. What, what the employer, employee has to pay is what the revenue collects. So I, I'm, I'm not sure it's a, a useful distinction, um, although I, I know that um, my, my friend relies on it in terms of sections 59A and 59B. But certainly, there's no reference to those collection and, and the, the amount of tax payable, the liability provisions in Tax Management Act under Regulation 180 years. Um, the bit which deals with the tax payable is subsection 2. And the reason why it also has to do with the assessment um, is um, paragraph 5. <clears throat> the, the amount of any shown in the notice of assessment as a deduction from or a credit against the tax payable under the assessment, so clearly there it's looking at tax payable, is to be taken as reduced by so much of the direction tax as was included in calculating the amount of tax referred to in paragraph 3A. So again, that's about collection. It's about what's payable by the individual or collectible by the revenue rather than yeah. well, what's assessed to tax. Uh, my lady, I think I can't repeat the importance of this enough. Um, an assessment is not limited to the amount on which a person is chargeable. Yeah. It includes the amount payable. So when this talks about the amount payable under the assessment. You say that's a reference. That, that, is, to... that is part of the assessment. Right. Okay. So, And what, what this is very clearly contemplating is that the notice of assessment shows that direction tax as a deduction because then it says, will you make an amendment to that? And so th that's why I say that this is focused on what's in the assessment. And then what's in the assessment tells the revenue what they can collect. So, my lady, I, I was promising to address it in the context of Section 8, um, which has a more prescriptive code in terms of what is required. Yep. Um, it's at page 18 of tab 1 of the legislation bundle. Sorry, this is Section 8 of the Taxes Management. We need to look at section 8 and section 9, but if we start at section 8. And which version should we be looking at? Um, if we look at page 18, that's the version from 2008, July 2009. I don't think there's any changes of relevance subsequent to that. So we see, for the purposes of establishing the amounts in which a person is chargeable to income tax and capital gains tax per, per year of assessment, so that's chargeability, and the amount payable by, by him by way of income tax for that year, he may be required by notice given to him by an officer of the board to make and deliver to the officer a return containing such information as may be reasonably required in pursuance of the notice, and to deliver with the return such accounts, statements, and documents relating to the information contained in the return as may be reasonably required. And then looking at subsection 1A, A, subsection, um, for the purposes of subsection 1 above, I'm going to B, the amount of tax payable by a person by way of income tax is the difference between the amount in which he is chargeable to income tax and the aggregate of any amount of income tax deducted at source and any tax credits to which section 3971 um, or 397A2 of ITOIA applies. <coughs> 
So that, that's setting out the amount of tax payable. If we then go to subsection 5, uh, it says in this section and sections 8A, 9 and 12AA of this Act, any reference to income tax deducted at source is a reference to income tax deducted or treated as deducted from any income treat or treated as paid on any, any income. So I think a, a lot turns on the meaning of subsection 5 and how it interacts with um, regulation 185. Um, what the upper tribunal said was that where an amount is actually deducted, then that amount is reflected in subsection 5. Where you have an amount which isn't actually deducted, but which is treated as paid by the employer under Regulation 185, the upper tribunal said that that's not included within this subsection. We say that's wrong. That you have an amount which is treated as deducted. That's what the effect of Section One Eight or Regulation One Eight Five is. Regulation One Eight Five defines these amounts. Is as, it treated as deducted or is it a set off? Well, I think if we, if we look at Regulation One Eight, <laughs> what it defines the amounts as is it defines them as tax treated as deducted. It uses the term tax treated as deducted, mm. which I'd submit it isn't accidental. Right. Okay. So the amount treated as deducted in Reg One Eight Five is is what is also being referred to in Section Eight, Subsection Five. Yes, that, that, that's that's our position. Um, just to carry that through to section 9, which does deal with the actual self-assessment. And subsection one, subsec, subject. Which sub version do you want us to look at? Um, if, if, again, we look at the first version on page twenty-seven, yes. which is April two thousand and eight to July two thousand and nine. I'm not aware that there's any material difference. Okay. And we just see, subject to subsections 1a and 2 below, every return under section 8 or 8a of this Act shall include a self-assessment, that is to say, an assessment of the amounts in which, on the basis of information contained in the return and taking into account any relief or allowance a claim for which is included in the return, the person making the return is chargeable to income tax and capital gains tax for the year of assessment. So that, that's the chargeability point. And then B, an assessment of the amount payable by him by way of income tax, that is to say the difference between the amount in which he is assessed to income tax under paragraph A above and the aggregate of any amount of income tax deducted at source and any tax credits to which section 3971 or 3972 by TOIA applies. And tax deducted at source. And no tax credits aren't in, in those. 3971 and 2 aren't relevant here. No. 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 Um, I, I'm just just to note that section 8.5 applies for the purposes of section 9 as well. So tax deducted at source has the meaning given in section 8.5. Where do we get that cross-reference? Uh, if we go to section 8.5 itself. 8.5 itself. 
through to the Regulation 185, which is tab 4, page 323. Now, in terms of the title, I have to accept that I made the point that Regulation 188 was directed to assessments, other than self-assessments. This does say it's directed to 59A and 59B. Um, in terms of the arguments made, well, 59A and 59B, sort of the application of them isn't a matter which is subject to the jurisdiction. You we, accept that? We, yeah, we, we don't argue that it is. We, we just say it's, it's, that's besides the point. Because? Um, because jurisdiction here is founded on the requirements of the tax return. The tax return is required to say the amount of tax payable. Um, and, and that carries its normal meaning, which means the amount which you ha actually have to pay, not an artificial meaning, which in some cases is different from the amount which you have to pay. Now, subparagraph so 1 does say that it applies for the purposes of 59A and 59B, the Taxes Management Act. No. Um, but subparagraph sub 2 talks about how one calculates the total net tax deducted after making any additions or subtractions by, sub by paragraphs 3 to 5. Um, and looking down at the bottom of the page, we see the definition of tax treated as deducted. <coughs> the amount that the employer was liable to deduct but failed to do so, or liable to account for but failed to do so. And, and, and stepping back, what we say the effect of this is that, at a practical matter, this tax is treated as having been deducted from income. Because that's what this does. It's not an accident that the language of the regulation talks about tax treated as deducted. And when one gets to Regulation 8.5, you ask the question, well, is this tax treated as deducted? And the answer is yes, that's what Regulation 185 does. It treats that tax as an amount which is deducted. Yes. Well, what I, sh I should say, my lord, is um, I'm not aware of any other circumstance where that would arise, because, and this goes back to, to what I was saying yesterday, it, it is so unusual that the amount of tax which you would have to pay um, would turn on an, the exercise of a discretion by the revenue. Um, but if what that... if you've been told something that gave rise to a legitimate expectation or, or an argument? That, which would feed into the amount that you might say should have been shown in the tax. Um, well, that raises interesting questions, but I, I think largely it, it's accepted that um, there's no general judicial review um, jurisdiction, and actually, in terms of legitimate expectation, for example, um, what the 
tribunal would be looking at is what is MI payable under the legislation. Um, and if you're saying relying on a legitimate expectation to say that a different amount is payable, you'd have to go by way of judicial review. Um, there, there may be potential arguments as to sort of how it feeds into an actual tax liability in other circumstances. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what those that would be. That is what you're arguing here. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. Yes, absolutely here. But here you have sort of not a general public law argument. You have a discretion which is apparently slap bang in the middle um, between liability and having to pay. Um, and so the amount which you have to pay um, and the amount which is fixed by the statute that you have to pay is something which depends very much on the revenue's discretion. And so it, it is, as we say, it's sort of why, why we say it, it can't do that. It, it's simply so unusual. And so you wouldn't normally have the tax tribunals addressing this sort of issue because it just wouldn't normally arise. Of course, one of the points we do make about why 7A seems unlikely that it operates in that way is that there's no right of appeal in respect of it. Um, that may be deliberate. Parliament may have taken the view that they don't want a merits appeal uh, and that if there is to be some challenge, it's a public law challenge. Um, it, it, it may be, but equally it may indicate, um, I admit that it does, um, that the discretion isn't as wide as all that. Um, and that sort of in the cases where we Parliament has provided for <coughs> liability to be transferred, for example, Regulation 72, there is an express right of appeal. Uh, I mean, but if Parliament it was allowed to rights of appeal because that mm. that section talked about appeal rights. Yes, uh, absolutely. So could um, easily have dealt and, with appeal rights. And, and Section 145, which inserted um, subsection 7A, yeah. um, also inserted, I think it was item 8 or yes. replacing item, item 8. Four. Um, but, but certainly a provision that there should be such rights as appeal as necessary. Yes. So they were alive to it, yes. But I, I suppose, well, one can, one can take the argument two ways. Um, the way in which um, we'd certainly take it, and the way in which I, I submit this court should take it, is that the fact that there's no right of appeal is a strong indication that the discretion wasn't intended to be that wide. But that, you're, and that's a different argument. But that, that, that is absolutely a different argument. Yeah. yeah. We're, uh, we're now on well, yeah, less no, jurisdiction. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, sorry, I was. Responding to the point that it does seem unusual that um, judicial review, or sorry, in the tax tribunal, you're considering these public law issues. And so my answer to that is that, well, that's because of the unusual nature of the discretion which is said to exist. But I think it is important to note that this jurisdiction point isn't limited to the sorts of cases where the 68478 a discretion is exercised. Um, it applies in any case where you have a credit under Regulation 185. So, heck, for example, the situation where the revenue come along and assess somebody, and the assessment says the amount of liability is X, the amount which is payable is Y, and the amount which is payable doesn't reflect any sort of credit under um, Regulation 185, because the view of the revenue is that this is a type of income which isn't subject to PAYE. There is no obligation to operate PAYE. The employee in that circumstance wants to say, well, actually, no, that's wrong. The person who should be paying this is my employer. Um, we say that, that that's, that's a case which is perfectly appropriate for the tax tribunals. Um, and, and in my opening remarks, I was making the point about it, would be, it might be a case where it's appropriate for alternative assessments. Um, but <laughs> on the revenues case, actually, the tribunal wouldn't have jurisdiction to address that point because it goes to the availability and the 
the right to claim the credit under Regulation 185. And I think that there's another quite important point in there, which is that although the question we're ultimately concerned with is jurisdiction, the provisions we're looking at concern self-assessment. And this is what taxpayers are required to do, what they're required to put down in their tax returns. And if the upper tribunal are correct, a taxpayer whose employer doesn't actually deduct or account to the revenue for the tax has to put down a greater amount of tax as payable on his tax return than one whose employer does. Now, so they, they, they put down the same amount of gross. Yes. But you're saying that the taxpayer whose employer doesn't deduct would have to put down in his tax return. Well, if, if the upper tribunal and HMRC are correct, that, that must follow, yes. So, in order to provide an accurate return, the employee is required to know has, has the employer actually paid the amounts over to HMRC. Which, with respect, it is not a practical and workable self-assessment system. What these provisions allow the employee to do is to assume that the employer has paid those amounts over and to do his return on that basis. And what it also means is that the number which you are required to put down in your self-assessment is the same number as what you're actually required to pay HMRC. Instead of this absurdity of the amount of tax payable is 100, but actually the amount of tax payable is only 75. I don't think one has to go very far by way of purpose of construction to say that in terms of a tax return, what is required in respect of the amount of tax payable should accurately reflect the real world position of the amount of tax payable. Nor does one have to go out of the way to say that, well, actually, whenever it talks about tax deducted at source in Regulation 85, that that matches up with the definition of tax deducted at source in Regulation 185, sorry, Section 85. <clears throat> it's not a construction which, well, it's not, I would say it, it follows naturally from the meaning of the words, but it's not a construction which is by any means forced upon the court, which is why, at the start of my mission submissions, I, I was sort of making a lot of the very general points about why it does make sense that all of this sort it, of stuff... It was just a very confusing way of doing it. It would have been helpful to see the legislation and then hear what you said about it. I apologise, my lady, I didn't get on board entirely. <laughs> well, it, that, that's how I felt. Yes, it, others may have felt differently. No, 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 I, I absolutely take on board. Um, and, and that's why we say the jurisdiction follows as a matter of construction. In terms of a normal assessment, you're just looking at what's payable, and you don't get into abstract notions of payable for the purpose of Section 8 and payable for real life purposes. Um, but in terms of self assessment, we say the two things are the same. The eight, Section 8 might payable. It's the same as the real life of my payable. Um, I was going to go on then to address how that feeds into subsection 7a, but I, I think I've dealt with that point. I think you have. Uh, in, in that case, I'll, that completes my submissions on, on the jurisdiction point, unless I can assist the court any further. Thank you.
Thank you Thank very you much, much, Mr. Mallon. My lady, my lords, um, I'm going to deal with issues one to seven in the list of issues. And then a friend, Miss Nathan, will be dealing with all the issues arising under paragraph eight. So in summary, that means I'll be dealing with all of the issues concerning 7A power and the regs. And Miss Nathan will be dealing with everything relating to the transfer of assets abroad regime. Um, by way of introduction, and before I go to the detail of the legislation. M Mr. Grudzinski, I'm so sorry to interrupt you so quickly. Uh, will you keep an eye on the time, and we'll have a break for the transcriber at around quarter past? Of course. Um, I'm going to start, if I may, by identifying what is, either through concession or otherwise, no longer in dispute in these proceedings. First, the claimants no longer dispute that the money that was paid to the offshore trusts, the EBTs, and which was then paid out to them by way of so-called loans. They were loans. I say so-called because Mr. Hoey conceded in cross-examination uh, in the tribunal that he never expected to have to repay them. Okay. There was no case of sham, no finding of sham. N none at all. In that case, they're not so called. I'll, they're I'll, I'll call them loans. Um, was their earnings on which they were chargeable to income tax under section 62 of ITPA? That concession, just for your note, was first made on the 12th of June 2019, almost two years after the Supreme Court decision in Rangers, and for your note, it's contained in a letter in the statutory appeal bundle at page 375. It was very shortly before the FTT hearing. That's the first matter, not in dispute. The second is that the claimants accept that this chargeable income was not declared in their self-assessment returns as they now accept it should have been. In other words, despite arguing, as we just heard from a learned friend, that the Regulation 185 credit for sums which end users should have accounted for, but didn't, was part of the assessment regime, including the self-assessment regime, the claimants did not, in fact, include the relevant amounts in their self-assessment terms. As I'll come back to, um, this is not a case where the claimants at any time operated on the assumption that the tax had been deducted or had been accounted for by the end users. Third, and at the risk of stating the obvious, it is common ground that no tax has been paid on the relevant sums by the claimants or anybody else. Fourth, the claimants accept that in time, Section 9A TMA inquiries were opened into Mr. Hoey's self-assessment return for the 2010-11 tax year, and they can no longer challenge the procedural validity of the discovery assessments for the earlier two years following the refusal of permission to appeal from the upper tribunal's refusal of their appeal on that point in September 2021. That's the order of Lord Justice Lewis and Core Bundle, tab 12, page 250. Thus, so far as the claimants, closure notices, and discovery assessments are concerned, the time limits 
under the Taxes Management Act have been complied with. Fifth. So what you're saying is, so, so, so what they're saying is, when you assess us as having received income, which we haven't declared, we're then entitled to say, to, to assume that that was deducted by the employer. I think that's what they're saying. Mm. And I'll come on to that point, my Lord, if I may. Um, the, the next point, which leads to the point that I think my Lord was making, is that the claimants accept that if the revenue had issued in time regulation 80 determinations against the end users for the tax which they had not accounted for under regulation 62.5 and if those sums had then not been paid by the end users Millennia Friend accepted in oral submissions, though it's not clear from his skeleton, but he accepted in oral submissions that it would have been open to the revenue then to issue Regulation 81 directions against the claimants collecting the tax from them. Sixth. Mr. Mullen accepted yesterday correctly that even if no Regulation 81 determinations had been issued by the revenue, so that the tax on the notional payments was then paid by the end users as deemed employers, he accepted correctly that those end users would have had a clear claim in restitution against the claimants for the tax which had been paid for the claimant's benefit. That concession was inevitable in light of a Court of Appeals decision in McCarthy and Stone, which I'll come back to. There would also be in a Section 222 charge. I'll come back to the Section 222 charge. So... Um, although Mr. Mullen on several occasions slipped into saying that the liability for the tax rested with the employer, there can be no doubt that it was the claimants who Parliament has made chargeable and liable to the tax and who would ordinarily be expected to bear the economic burden of that tax themselves. With that common ground in mind, one can see, and I think this is the point um, my Lord Lord Justice Phillips was coming towards, one can see that the claimant's case depends upon being to take advantage of the TMA time limits for making Regulation 80 determinations which apply for the benefit of the employers and more importantly and this is the heart of the case the claimants must establish that the only way in which the commissioners could collect the tax from the claimants was first by seeking it from the deemed employers under Regulation 80 and then making Regulation 81 directions collecting the tax from the employee claimants. And the ultimate question in this claim for judicial review is whether the commissioners were bound to follow that approach by first issuing Reg 80 determinations and then Regulation 81 directions, or whether, as they decided, it was appropriate not to do so and instead to collect the money directly from the claimants, who were, after all, the persons who had received the income on which no deduction of tax had been made 
and on which they have not paid any tax. In our submission, Parliament has conferred a wide discretionary power in section 684.7ab, I'm going to call it 7a for shorthand, which recognises that despite the detail of the provisions in the PAYE regulations, the commissioners may form the view that in the circumstances of a case, it is not appropriate to expect an employer, or in this case, somebody who has been deemed to be an employer, to comply with the accounting and collection obligations in those regulations. In our submission, in the unusual circumstances of these cases, which entailed detailed arrangements that are very far indeed from typical of the way that most employees in this country receive their earnings, we submit it was plainly lawful for the commissioners to decide it was not appropriate to expect the end users to have collected the tax. And that is so irrespective of whether the commissioners were in time to have issued Regulation 80 determination. In particular, that is so because so far as the commissioners understood on the basis of the information available to them, the end users were unaware of the arrangements and they would have thus been unaware of the following. They would have been unaware that the individual contractors providing them with services such as Mr. Hoey were ultimately employed by entities that were offshore rather than by the UK entities with whom the end user clients contracted. They would have had no idea that they might be deemed to be employers under section 689 ITPA and they would have thus had no idea that they were therefore making what the legislation calls notional payments of PAYE income to the claimants on which they might have been required to account for tax under Regulation 62.5 of the regs. Nor would they have known that the claimant's remuneration was being paid up the chain and I'm going to show you what the chain looked like very shortly, in the form of a base salary on which the offshore employers had voluntarily operated PAYE, with the larger balance being provided through monies paid into and then out of employment benefit trusts in the form of the loans on which no tax would be deducted or accounted. And in those circumstances, our core submission is that it was entirely rational, intravires, Padfield compliant, for the revenue to decide it was not appropriate to expect the oblivious end users to have complied with their obligations under Reg 62.5 to have accounted for the tax. That's, I hope, a helpful summary of where I'm going to go. Before I turn to the legislation, I just want to make a number of points on the factual evidence concerning the knowledge of the end user. <coughs> um, can I start, please, by going back to the letter to Mr. Hoey that my learned friend took you to yesterday, supplementary JR bundle, page 59. 
this is the letter in case our pagination mismatches of the 13th of October 2017. Need to make a number of points. Firstly, <coughs> contrary to um, what is, if I may say so, the rather ambitious submission by um, Mr. Mullen, that he didn't understand what this letter was asking about, there was no ambiguity at all about what was being asked for in the letter. As my lady pointed out, the penultimate paragraph clearly refers to the 7 8 power and makes clear that the officer considered it to be relevant to the exercise of that power, what end users did and didn't know about the arrangements. And that was why in the last paragraph, Mr. Hoey was being given the chance to say anything he wanted to on that question. As the court saw yesterday, and I'm not going to go back to it, the, the reply from RPC at pages 60 and 61 advanced various arguments but at no point did they say we don't really understand what you're asking us to give representations on still less of course did they ever suggest that the end users had been told anything about the arrangements and the position is identical for each of the other claimants in the JR as we saw yesterday and Mr Mullen's point about uh, the letter being unclear in terms of what was being asked for is particularly hollow because even in these JR proceedings not a single one of the claimants has filed a witness statement still less any documentary evidence to show that they told their end users anything about the schemes instead what they have done is filed two witness statements from a Mr. Hamilton and a Mr. Williamson who are not claimants but on which Milena Friend placed some reliance in his submissions today. They were both directors of the... Well, one was a director. Was. I'll, I'll show my lady. Mm. So the, the, the evidence from these two witnesses says, well, end users knew about the arrangement, so one infers that the inference this court's being asked to draw if they knew about them, so must the end users of the claimants. Can I deal firstly with Mr. Hamilton's statement? It's at tab two. Page, starting at page six. Um, th there's a coincidence that he's called Mr. Hamilton and he used the Hamilton Trust arrangements, but I think one has nothing to do with the other. He says, Paragraph 6, bottom of page 6. I can confirm that while I was engaged in the Hamilton arrangements, the end user client was fully aware of the nature of these arrangements in that they were based offshore and that I received periodic loans from each. I can't imagine how it could be said that end users were not aware of these arrangements, not least because I provided them with the detail. Um, although I operated through Hamilton, the end user client was HyroPure. That's not one of our end users. No. Um, my lady, what Mr. Hamilton failed to disclose and what the claimants failed to disclose in seeking to rely upon this witness statement was, as my lady has recalled correctly, Mr. Hamilton was a director of PyroPure. That is set out, I'll give you the reference, in Mr. Um, Scott McFarlane's second witness statement, tab 4, page 176. Um, my lady and my lords will know that the duty of candour applies to claimants in judicial review proceedings just as it applies to defendants. There is ample authority for that proposition, but I'm going to give you one reference. I'm not sure it's in the bundle. It's Khan and the Home Secretary, 2016, EWCA Civ 416, at paragraph 35, per Lord Justice Beaton. We've got copies here, but I don't suppose it's going to be in dispute. In my respectful submission, this statement from Mr. Hamilton and the claimants via their legal advisers, no doubt, attempt to rely upon it is 
quite remarkable in its lack of candor. All the more so given that the claimants make their own complaint about the breach of duty of candor by the revenue. That's Mr. Hamilton. As to Mr. Williamson, he provides no documents to support his assertion that he told his end user, an entity called MITI, M-I-T-I-E, about the arrangements. Um, he criticizes the revenue. MITI was not an end user in any of the claimants. Not so far as we know. Um, he criticizes the revenue for not having made inquiries of MITI, but he fails to disclose that MITI was dissolved in April 2015, as Mr. McFarlane discovered when he investigated the matter following receipt of these statements, see his second witness statement. Finally, my lady and my lords, perhaps somewhat less dramatically, because I'm, I'm not making a candor point now, I'm making a no similar fact evidence point. Even if some people, like Mr. Williamson, had told their end users that they had participated in these schemes, there's no basis to infer the position is the same for the claimants' end users. On the contrary, given that the claimants have conspicuously failed to tell the revenue what information they gave to their end users and have conspicuously failed to file their own witness statements in these proceedings, the obvious conclusion is that they told them nothing. Just check before you leave that being said in open court on a live stream, you're not saying MITI, which MITI company is it you're saying was, was dissolved? Um, can I show my lord what Mr... I don't want to give evidence. <coughs> if I can show my lord Mr McFarlane's second witness statement. It's MITI Engineering Maintenance North Limited. Yes, that's the then. only one that's Yes, sold. that was the end user. Yeah. I, I'm, just, I'm going on what Mr McFarlane says in paragraphs 3.7 and 3.8 of his witness statement. Yes. But you just said MITI was dissolved. <laughs> Maybe, I, 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 perhaps MITI means more to some people than it does to others, but is it a big... Yes. Right. <laughs> okay. Very. Very big. Right. And, and I'm sure very healthy. And right, okay. And Before their share so price plunges. Well-known organisations. <laughs> right, okay. Is, is it like BNF or yeah, whatever? <laughs> okay, well, that, that reveals my ignorance of the world of engineering. Um, I, I will, if I may, come back later to address Melona Friend's submission on whether the revenue had a um, greater duty to investigate what end users knew going beyond the facts of this case. But there's just one other factual matter to draw to the court's attention. Um, Melena Friend, at this stage, Melena Friend asserted yesterday for the first time that it would have been simple and obvious and reasonable, um, in particular for what he described fairly as a sophisticated financial institution like Aviva, and believe it or not, I have heard of Aviva, um, to have asked Mr. Hoey, who was he employed by? And he, uh, he made that point at some length today. Can I hand up, please, um, the contract between um, the various entities, um, including Aviva and Mr. Hoey? This was in the FTT. Um, given copies to my learned friend. Just to identify, can I suggest, my lord, my lady, that we put it right at the back of the supplementary JR bundle? Um, just to identify who the parties are. The parties are an entity called Oldbury Howard Limited in London, an entity called the Supplier, which is Cascade Management Solutions Limited. It's, it's that's the supplier's representative, Mr. Hoey, and the client, 
Aviva. Um, at the risk of stating the obvious, there is no mention in this document of Penfolds or Hamilton Trust or any other um, employer. What is the agreement? The client agreement is defined as an agreement between Oldbury Howard and the client for the provision of services by the supplier. And the supplier's representative is Mr. Hoey. We can see what the services are. They are computer consultancy services by the supplier to the client at the contract site of number one, Poultry. The pay rate is £550 plus VAT per day, so it's not a contract of employment, it's a contract for services. We can see that later on. And this includes VAT. Sorry? And this includes VAT. Well, that's, why, that, that's not an obvious reason why it's not an employment contract. Well, that, and not an overseas supplier either. There, there are different rules about VAT in the Channel Islands, but yes, my lord. Um, the, the key point I want to draw out for now is um, apparent from Clause 3. Clause 3 um, says, the supplier for itself and on behalf of the representative will not, dot, 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 3.3, discuss with the client, that's Aviva, the terms of this agreement, other than strictly as required for the proper objectives of the project. So there is a contractual prohibition on the supplier, including the supplier's representative, Mr. Hoey, against telling Aviva anything about the terms of this agreement. I'll come back to the point about what, in light of that, and indeed even without such a clause, uh, uh, um, an end user could reasonably have been expected <coughs> to discover. But on the face of it, this is not a contract that was uh, uh, um, going to be shown to Aviva, despite them being uh, the named client. And there was a prohibition on Aviva being told anything about the terms of the agreement. So in terms of the general framework we've been told about, I mean, the, the, the entity I, um, defined here as a supplier is what we've been referring to as an intermediary in the UK. Um, well, I think there are two intermediaries. There's the supplier and there is Oldbury Howard. Um, My understanding of the chain yes, is that... What is Oldbury? <laughs> well... Uh, uh, um, Yes, you're quite right. I mean, you're, um, but it does Oldbury feature in the? No, it's a, yes, it's an agreement between Oldbury and the client. Indeed, Aviva. Indeed. So I suppose yes. So Oldbury obviously is an intermediary. I, I think, as I understand it, the chain is starting at the top. Um, offshore employer, which, given the time frame here, would have been Hamilton Trust. Cascade is the supplier. Howard Oldbury is the um, entity who is contracting with the client for the provision of services by Mr. Hoey, the representative, and then Aviva's at the bottom. But so, Aviva is not party to this contract. No. So we haven't seen, we don't know what they saw or signed. There was quite a lot of attempts to investigate this, and there were chunks of the FTT transcript devoted to Miss Nathan cross-examining such witnesses as were tendered by the appellants to try to get to the bottom of it. It was um, opaque, putting it kindly. But there is a client agreement. This is the supplier agreement, and yes. there is a client agreement. There must have been a client agreement. Well, it's referred to. Yes, indeed. Between Albury and Aviva. Yes. 
it does, perhaps it's an unfair comment, it does give the impression that it was all made to look as opaque as possible. Anyone trying to work out the... <laughs> I'm not, with respect, sure that is an unfair comment. Um, it's, all, I mean, what's what's conspicuous it? about it is that, you, that, that even if Aviva had received this, they would have had no idea that there was anybody offshore employing Mr. Hoey. And why is Mr. Hoey acting as a representative of the supplier? I don't know. There must be an agreement between Mr. Hoey and Cascade as well. You would have thought so. Yeah. Well, and indeed, um, Cascade uh, is fully responsible for indemnifying Oldbury in relation to any possible employment-related claim or claim based on worker status brought by Mr. Hoey. My lady, all, all these points are, with respect, well made. But I repeat the point that Mr. Hoey has not filed any witness no. statement in these proceedings explaining any of this. Um, so it's somewhat difficult for his counsel, Mr. Mullen, to submit that all these things were easily discoverable um, by the end user. But Mr. Um, Hoey must have... No, sorry, it's not right. <laughs> That's the trouble. Every time one looks at these arrangements, what things that seem obvious perhaps are not. Well, he must have his he must have his contract with Cascade. But one would have thought so. Well, how does he get paid? Yes. Um, well, he gets paid by, as I understand it, he gets paid by Penfolds, his employer, the base salary and the loans, or rather, that he gets paid the base salary by. Not, I'm not calling it Penfolds. It's Hamilton Trust. He gets paid the base salary by Hamilton Trust offshore, and he gets paid the loans through the EBT offshore. So Aviva pays Cascade. Aviva, pays I think Aviva, I Oldbury. suspect Aviva pays Oldbury. Yeah. Oldbury pays either Cascade or Hamilton Trust, and Hamilton Trust, in any event, pay him the base salary, transfer the balance after deduction of fees along the way to. Um, the EBT and the trustees pay out the loan to him. So basically, we, we infer the money gets what one might call in real terms the wages. They go in a in a sort of circle, right? With fees probably being deducted. They're, they're undoubtedly, fees are deducted along the way. In, the in what term. amount? We, we no. as, as I understand it, was never got to the bottom of. And the money has to go in the circle because that's really the only way that Mr. Hoey ends up yeah, getting getting some money in his pocket. Pounds a day. Absolutely. Um, so subject to fees. That is the economic nature of the exercise. Yes. Well, we know we know that Aviva pays Oldbury. Yes. And we don't know how much. No. And then Oldbury pays Cascade the five fifty. Yeah, because that's plus rent. Possibly. Well, that's what, well, that's what the contract's for. It's the supplier agreement. It's Cascade paying. Yes. If the contract is adhered to, yes. And then, but what we don't know then is the relationship between Cascade and Hamilton. Nor the relationship, and it could be that other money is paid by Oldbury to Hamilton. We just don't know. And we don't also know, and presumably lots of people were using these arrangements. There wasn't just one oh, no. person, it wasn't just Mr. Hoey, it's probably on the EBT. Well, the reason that there's so much money at stake in these proceedings yes, is because just lots hundreds. And lots of people were doing it. Yeah. But, so a lot of the payments would have been global aggregate, presumably sums paid on behalf of a very large number of people. We don't, simply don't know the details. I don't, I don't know whether m there was more than one end user being. Uh, Providing services to somebody like Aviva, but, they were, but, 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 but aggregates might have gone up the chain. They may. But one thing we can infer pretty confidently is that the at the end is that the sum total of the amounts paid by way of um, remuneration subject to PAYE and the amounts to fund the EBTs to make the loans must have added up to. Five, the equivalent of 550 per day after deduction of fees. Yes. I think that must be right, my lord. I mean, otherwise the scheme wouldn't work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Mr. Hoey has to end up with the money in his pocket, albeit by yeah. this very roundabout route. 
and he gets some of the benefit of the tax avoidance, but some of that is taken up with fees. I forget which tribunal it was, made some findings about the, all these sort of promotional literature showing that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you the promotional okay. literature. Okay, I mean, that shows why all this was an attractive carrot for somebody in Mr. Hoey's position. It, it, it's, it's, it's in the, the, it's in the JR bond. It. It's in the JR bond. Yeah. There was about 80% of yeah. money it, 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 to it's, pounds rather than 50. The, the promotional literature starts um, at page 139 of the bundle. But the, the first bit of it is for an entity called Assignment Solutions, which is the predecessor, albeit using the same arrangements as Penfold. Um, and you can see, my lady, my lords, a diagrammatic explanation of what's going on, albeit not entirely clear, at page 143. Cascade are probably XXX Limited and Agency. Yes, I think Cascade is Agency and Albury Howard is XXX, one in first. Although, sorry? Maybe, then if friend says it's the other way around. I think it must, I think it must. Yeah, I think it's the other way around. Um, while I'm here, but it's a point I'm going to come back to when I deal with Mr. Mullen's territoriality point, could I just um, show you something about this uh, uh, iteration of the scheme at page 141? But I'm going to have to come back to this point in more detail later. Page 141, under the heading by the lower hole punch, Assignment Solutions Employer, Third bullet, no place of business in the UK. And then to my Lord, Lord Justice Henderson's point about these not being just single arrangements, um, about four bullets down from that, currently has over 900 employees stroke contractors. Yes. Um, that's all I wanted to say for now, at least, about the facts. Can I turn then to our submissions on the proper construction of the legislation? Well, would that be a good moment just to have a very short break? Yes, of course. Break? Thank you very much. We'll do that. Five minutes. Thank you. All rise.
table is one page. I'm now going to turn to our submissions on the proper construction of the legislation, starting with 7a. Our first submission is that on its face, the power conferred by 7a is a wide one. The question for the officer is simply whether, in the circumstances, he or she is satisfied that it would be unnecessary or inappropriate for the payer to comply with the PAYE regulation. If we turn it up, I suspect different people have marked it up in different page numbers. I happen to have it at page 230, but maybe somewhere else as well. It is somewhere else as well. Two points follow from the words. First, because the words unnecessary and 
not appropriate are used in the alternative by the parliamentary draftsman. Parliament has contemplated that an officer may be satisfied that it would be inappropriate to expect compliance with the regulations, even where compliance were otherwise necessary. Second, I'm sure this is common ground, by empowering the officer to decide what is appropriate, Parliament has decided that it should be within the discretion of the officer to decide when compliance with the regulations would not be appropriate. That is obviously not an untrammeled power, but rather one that must be exercised in accordance with common law principles of public law, including, of course, the obligation to act Wensbury rationally and the Padfield obligation not to act inconsistently with the purpose of the legislation. Can I then address the claimant's case that exercising the 7A power in this case was contrary to the purposes of what they call the PAYE code? And by the PAYE code, what Melinda Friend means in his skeleton argument is um, the relevant chapter of ITPA and the regs. But it's important just at the beginning to unpack two limbs to his argument. The first limb is that the power is contrary to a legislative purpose of ensuring that it is the employee, employer, I beg your pardon, who should pay the tax, who has the obligation to pay the tax. He asserts that is a purpose. The second limb of his argument is what I might call the complete code point. He says the regulations provide a complete code or the means by which collection should be achieved from the employee. And so exercising a power outside of those regulations is contrary to the statutory purpose. Just starting with the first of those two limbs, with respect, Mr. Mullen's argument is based on a fundamental mistake about who has liability for income tax. As my Lord, Lord Justice Henderson observed right at the outset yesterday, running through the claimant's case is the confused suggestion that primary liability for the tax is that of the employer. And that mistake was not just made in Mr. Mullen's oral submissions, but appears in his skeleton argument as well. See in particular, skeleton argument, paragraph 52. But as the court well understands, that position is wrong. Sections 6, 4, and 13, 2 of ITPA, which I don't need to go back to, place liability for income tax on the employee. The questions of how and when and from whom that tax is collected do not alter that fundamental position. That has always been clear, but was made even clearer by this court's decision in the case of McCarthy and Stone, authorities bundle tab 19. We could just turn that up. This was a dispute as between the former chairman and former employee of the defendant, eponymous defendant company, in which the employee sought to argue that where um, McCarthy and Stone had paid um, tax and NICs in relation to the exercise of share options, it was not doing so on his behalf. That argument was rejected by Mr Justice Peter Smith and by the Court of Appeal. If 
the court, please, could go to page 235 of the report, which is 395 of the bundle. Just picking it up at letter B, paragraph 37. Mr Justice Peter Smith concluded that the claimant had no defence to the counterclaim on the grounds that the company has paid the tax on his behalf which the claimant would otherwise be liable to pay. He has received that benefit also because he has, when his assessment return is sent in and the tax calculated, been given the benefit of that deduction and the payment made by the company. It's only his liability in question. Merely because the revenue law is designed to ensure that the revenue obtain early monies from somebody other than the ultimate taxpayer as a matter of operation of the recovery of its tax is neither here nor there. The company is deducting monies which represent his income tax liability. Counsel for the claimant submit that the judge was wrong on two grounds. The first ground is irrelevant. The second ground by letter E. The second is that the payment of the tax and the primary mix by the company to the revenue did not discharge a liability for that amount due by the claimant to the revenue. It's accepted that such payment was for the benefit of the claimant, but so it is submitted that is not enough. I have no hesitation in rejecting the first objection. Well, let's leave that aside. Paragraph 40. So the validity of the judge's decision depends on the second point. We've had the benefit of much fuller arguments than he had. Much of it involves penetrating the thicket of the system. But when one emerges, the overall wood is, in my view, clear and may be summarised in a few sentences. And my lords and my lady will wish to look at that in due course. But I focus particularly on subparagraphs 2 and 3. <coughs> And then briefly over the page, paragraph 42, as is well known, the PAYE system is designed to recover tax due on the income of an employee from its source, that's the employer, and in anticipation of the liability which arises at the end of the year of assessment in which it's paid. Accordingly, it's hardly surprising that the PAYE regulations do not impose any liability on the employee. That's done by primary legislation, namely ITPA, to which I have referred, and the general machinery for the collection contained in the TMA, which I now turn to. I'll come back to the TMA. So, at the risk of stating the obvious, there is nothing in ITPA suggesting that Parliament had a purpose by which, if no tax has in fact been deducted or accounted for by an employer or deemed employer, the employee should nonetheless be forgiven for his own tax liability. N nor indeed is there any policy discernible in the regulations by which the tax in relation to an employee's PAYE income always falls to be collected from the employer. We can see that from the possibility of making directions under Regulation 72, 72 F and 81, which I'll come back to. And that's why 7A relieves the payer but doesn't impose an obligation on the payee because the obligation is, in, is already there. Precisely so. That's, that's the answer to Mr Mullins this only operates in a one-sided, unilateral, relieving way. That's precisely so, my lady. So can I then turn to the next part of the argument, the second limb, the complete code point? Um, just as a, by way of preliminary, there are, of course, some situations in which Parliament sets out a complete code um, so that there is little, if any, room for the relevant public authority to make a decision outside of that code, sometimes called covering the territory. This is manifestly not such a case. As my Lord Lord Justice Henderson has observed, Parliament has, within the single same section of ITPA, namely 684, both given the commissioners the duty to make the regulations, which, by the way, do not have to cover all the territory. And I'll come back to that point, because although they have a duty to make regulations, those regulations <coughs> clearly, when we, we look at 684, do not have to be exhaustive. They've both given a duty to make non-exhaustive regulations, and in the same section, given the commissioners the power to decide, where appropriate, that uh, the employer is not required to comply with them. Um, I'll come in a minute to section 145 of the Finance Act, which introduced the package of measures.
But can I just pause to observe that that Act, Section 145 of the Finance Act, was passed in July 2003, several months before the regulations were made. So um, the 7A power was in existence before the regulations themselves that were made still less came into force. Um, a further reason why the complete code point does not assist is that Parliament may, on occasion, enact several statutory provisions with overlapping aims and applications. That was the point made by Lord Newberger in the CUSAC case. I'm not going to go back to it. It's for your note. Authorities Bundle, tab 25, page 623, paragraph 60 to 61. I say I'm not going to go back to that. What I am going to do instead is to show you two decisions where that principle has been applied in this very context. The first is the FTT decision in Higgs, Additional Authorities Bundle, tab 12. Um, Higgs is the decision of the first tier tribunal. Um, I think it's on appeal to the upper tribunal, but um, it raised very similar issues to this litigation, including as to the jurisdiction of the tribunal to consider the employee's entitlement to a Reg 185 credit following the exercise of a 7A power. Just to fix it in time, it was decided after... HOE FTT and before HOE Upper Tribunal. Um, the FTT in Higgs agreed with the Crown and with the Tribunal in HOE on the jurisdiction question, but went on to deal obiter with the argument raised by counsel for the taxpayer, Mr. Gordon, um, in similar terms to the way in which Mr. Mullen puts the argument. Um, can I ask you to look at page 573 of the report, which is 227 of the bundle? Picking it up at paragraph 79. The judge says, I wasn't referred to Benyon and the authorities cited there, though I have read though I have reviewed it while writing up this decision, it supports the view I had already reached. The basic principle was articulated by the Master of the Rolls in Pretty and Solly, um, and that's the general and particular rule. However, this is not true, where instead of a specific provision and a more general provision, there are simply provisions with overlapping aims and overlapping applications. See CUSAC. In my view, the aims and applications of the 7AB power overlap with those of Regs 72 and 80, it follows that they are not mutually exclusive and that the generality of the former shouldn't be narrowly construed to infringing the principle that the specific overrides the general. While overlapping provisions undoubtedly make it harder for the courts and tribunals to identify the purpose of any given section, it is open to Parliament to enact them if it wishes. I can't agree with Mr Gordon's submission that giving a 7AB power a wide, including retrospective interpretation, undermines the careful balance within the regulations. I consider that it was intended the Commissioner should have both the discretion conferred by 7AB and the powers contained in Regulation 72 and 80. Uh, and then while we're here, so I don't have to come back to it when I deal with retrospectivity. Furthermore, I reject Mr Gordon's primary submission that the 7AB power must operate prospectively. Only on the contrary, I agree with what Mr Norbat, uh, that the converse is true. There's nothing in the wording that cuts down the exercise of the discretion to a prospective application so long as the discretion is properly exercised in accordance with the statutory requirement, i.e. that an officer is satisfied that it's unnecessary or not appropriate that a person comply, I see no difficulty with the decision having a prospective and or retrospective effect. So that's what the FTT said in Higgs. And then to similar effect, albeit without reference to CUSAC, can I show what uh, um, Mrs Justice 
Boundaries, as she then was said in this case, when refusing permission, its core bundle right at the end um, page 540 of the core bundle I'm not going to um, read it out could I just invite my lords and my lady to read the whole of paragraph 30 to 34 and, and, and if it's not inconvenient to do so now that bundle away and come back to the legislation bundle to section 684 page 228 my learned friend's answer to all of this yesterday was to refer to list item 4A in subsection 2 of section 684. You can just look at that. It's a Vyries power, obviously. It's a Vyries um, provision, of course. Um, provision authorizing the recovery from the payee rather than the payer of any amount that an officer of revenue and customs considers should have been deducted by the payer. Mr. Mullins argument, so I understand it, is that if the commissioners are going to recover from a payee at all, this item shows it must have been Parliament's intention that they had to do it under the regulations made pursuant to this power. Um, there are three answers to that submission. The first is that list item 4A, which I've just shown you, and subsection 7a were both introduced by section 145 of the Finance Act 2003 and are expressly doing different things and dealing with different situations. The situation contemplated in item 4a concerns circumstances where the officer considers that the payer should have deducted the tax. By contrast, subsection 7a is concerned with the situation in which the officer considers that it is not appropriate to require such compliance. 
So far from demonstrating that the present territory must be covered by regulations made under item 4A, the difference between the language of 4A and subsection 7A shows precisely the opposite, in particular given that they were enacted within the same section 145 of the Finance Act 2003. That's the first answer. The second answer is that while section 684 subsection 1 impose a mandatory duty to make regulations, contrary to what Mr. Mullen said, subsection 2 does not indicate that the regulations have to be exhaustive. It says PAYE regulations may in particular, include any such provision as is set out in the following list. So they do have to make regulations. They're given guidance in section 6842 as to what the regulations may in particular include. It's not exhaustive and it's not mandatory. That's the second answer. The third answer goes back to the language of item 4A, list item 4A, which is that it refers to amounts which should have been deducted. But Mr. Mullen doesn't suggest this is a deduction case at all. He accepts that because these were notional payments by a deemed employer, subject to his territoriality point, there was no obligation to deduct, but rather an obligation to account under Regulation 62.5. And list item 4A makes no mention of uh, um, accounting. So those are three complete answers to Mr. Mullen's reliance on list item 4A. It, and that complete. Just remind me which is the duty to account Regulation 62? 62. 62 sub 5. Sub 5. I'm going to show it to you in due course. Can I just, just test that out a little bit? Um, the end user, <coughs> um, surely the analysis is here that as a strict application of the provisions, the end user should have deducted from what it paid. Well, the legislation draws a distinction in section 710 and in regulations 26, which we haven't looked at, and regulation 62, which we will look at again, between obligations to deduct from actual payments made to an employee and obligations to account where there are no actual payments to an employee and instead notional payments of uh, PAYE income. It takes a little bit of unpacking, my lord, and I will take you to it when we get to the regulations. But that's the short answer to my lord's question. So it isn't the case here that the end user made payment? Not within the meaning of Regulation 62. Because if the, if the end user had made actual payments to the employee, it would have had an obligation to deduct. But as we'll see when we come on to look at Regulation 62 sub 5, we're in a, or 62, the whole of it, and in particular 62 to sub 5. It's common ground that this is an obligation to account case uh, at, uh, and I, to account for the tax uh, in relation to the notional payments of PAYE income, not an obligation to deduct tax and then to pay that deducted tax onto the Crown um, uh, uh, from payments of PAYE income actually made to the employee. And I think at one point Mr. Mullen might have suggested, or perhaps I got the wrong impression, that the end user would have been under a duty to deduct PAYE from the payments it made to the um, intermediary, and that can't be right. I don't think that's right either. Because, um, because after all, the intermediary isn't an employee. Indeed so. The intermediaries are covered by Regulation 67. They're covered by 67, to. yes, I see. Yes. Um, so, th that's what I want to say on the complete code point. Can I now turn to why, on the unusual fact of this case, none of the 
particular regulations, namely 72, 72F and 81, were used. And I do emphasize the word unusual because it will indeed be unusual, one would have thought, to have a situation in which a client of a contractor who has dealt with a UK-based entity, whether you call it an umbrella agency, a, an employment business, an employment agency, will nonetheless, and entirely unbeknown to them, be deemed to be an employer under Section 689, because unbeknown to them, there's an offshore uh, actual employer. And again, because they've been told nothing of the detail of the arrangements, will be ignorant of their liability to account for tax. I mean, I'll come back to what the employers, I beg your pardon, the end users, could have found out if they had asked. It's quite, um, but but, but th these are unusual circumstances on any view. Um, I'm going to come in a minute to Regulations 80 and 81, which are obviously at the heart of Mr. Mullen's case. But can I now do what I promised to do with my Lord Lord Justice Phillips a few moments ago, which is to go back and explain in the regulations uh, the distinction between notional payments <coughs> and actual payments of PAYE income, and also the difference between the obligation on an employer or deemed employer to deduct tax, which it can only do from what the legislation calls actual payments made to an employee, and the separate obligation to account for tax when no such deduction is possible. Um, if we could turn then to the regulations, um, just to give you some definitions to start with in regulation 2, page 278, Notional payment has the meaning given to it in section 7102A. One highlights that. PAYE income has the meaning given to it in section 683. Then turning straight forward, please, to page 292, regulation 21. On making a relevant payment to an employee during a tax sorry, year, give me the page number again. 292. On making a relevant payment to an employee during a tax year, an employer must deduct or repay tax in accordance with these regulations by reference to the employee's code if the employee uh, has one. So that caters for the generality of cases, most cases in which an employer makes salary payments of money to the employee and deducts the relevant amount pursuant to whatever code applies, which will take into account personal reliefs um, and other matters. Um, sometimes, as the court has seen, an employer or deemed employer will make other kinds of payments, which the legislation calls notional payments. And I've shown you what the definition of a notional payment is. It's defined in Reg 2 by reference to Section 710 of ITPA. Can we go to 710 of ITPA uh, at page 243? So it's specifically defined in Reg 2 by reference to subsection 710-2A. For the purposes of this section, a notional payment is a payment treated as made by virtue of any of sections 687, 689, and 693-700. Let's just go through them very briefly. Um, section 687 is at um, page 242A. That is payments by an intermediary. I hope my lord and my lady have that. 
So just to just to put it to one side, but, but six eight seven one. If any payment of or an account of PAY income of an employee is made by an intermediary of the employer, the employer is to be treated for the purposes of PAYE regulations as making a payment of income equal to the amount given by subsection three. So essentially, it's putting the uh, uh, um, employer in the shoes of or putting the uh, um, intermediary in the shoes of the employer and vice versa. That's one kind of notional payment. The next kind of notional payment identified in 7102A is the 689 notional payment, which is relevant in this case, and I'm going to come to in a second. And then the last category of notional payments are those made by virtue of sections 693 to 700, and those are, putting it broadly, various kinds of benefit in kind. Cash vouchers, non-cash vouchers, uh, um, share-related payments, etc. We don't need to go through them all. Of course, the specific kind of notional payment with which we are concerned in this case is under section 689. If we just turn that up, please. It's at page 242G. Subsection 1. I'm just going to go through it briefly. This section applies if an employee, so I'm going to write in the relevant people, Mr. Hoey, during any period works for a person, the relevant person, that's the end user, Aviva, AXA, whoever, who is not the employer of the employee. The employer of the employee is either Penfolds or Hamilton Trust. So A is satisfied, that's common ground. B. Any payment of or on account of PAYE income of the employee in respect of that period is made by a person who is the employer or an intermediary of the employer or of the relevant person. C. PAYE regulations do not apply to the person making the payment, so that's Penfolds or Hamilton, or if that person makes the payment as an intermediary, the employer. So that, that's so that's the new point about territoriality, which I will come back to. But subject to his, him being permitted to advance the new point and doing so successfully, uh, uh, um, section 6891C is also satisfied. D, income tax is not deducted or not accounted for in accordance with the regulations by the person making the payment, or if that person makes the payment as an intermediary of the employer or of the relevant person, the employer. Um, Again, that is satisfied. Two, the relevant person, that's the end user, is to be treated for the purposes of the regulations as making the payment of PAYE income of the employee of an amount equal to the amount given by subsection 3. And subsection 3 essentially means it's the gross amount. We then turn back, please, to the regulations. Just stopping there. So the so the the end user is treated as making a payment of a gross amount. Yes. But not liable to make a deduction. Well, we'll we'll, we'll come to, we'll come to the liability to make a deduction. If we can then go back to um, the regulations to answer my lord's question. Um, and pick it up at Regulation 62. Which is at page 293. This regulation applies if an employer makes a relevant payment which is a notional payment to an employee. The employer must, so far as possible, deduct tax required to be deducted in respect of the notional payment in accordance with any of the provisions listed in paragraph 3 from any relevant payment or payments which the employer actually makes to the employee at the same time as the notional payment. And then five, if the relevant payments actually made 
are insufficient to enable the employer to deduct the full amount of tax due in respect of notional payments, the employer must account to the board for any amount which the employer is unable to deduct. And there is no dispute in this case that insofar as the end users had an obligation that was not disapplied by the 7A power, it was an obligation to account under 62.5 because they made no actual payments. The end users, Viva, AXA, etc., made no actual payments to Mr. Hoey or any of the claimants. Can one then turn to consider what happens if an employer does not meet the obligations I've shown you already? No, I beg your pardon, there's one further step. It's Regulation 68, starting at 295. So, obviously, there's an obligation to deduct, but that doesn't tell you anything about what you have to do with the amount deducted. Regulation 68. This regulation applies to determine how much an employer must pay or can recover for a tax period. If A exceeds B, the employer must pay the excess to the revenue. And then sub 4. In this regulation, A is the total amount of tax which the employer was liable to deduct from relevant payments made by the employer, plus the total amount of tax for which the employer was liable to account in respect of notional payments made by the employer under Regulation 62.5. So one then turns to consider what happens if any of these obligations are not met by the employer. Um, and there are various regulations, as we've seen. The first, although not relevant on the facts of this case, was Regulation 72 at page 297. Just to unpack it a bit, this regulation applies if it appears to the inland revenue that the deductible amount exceeds the amount actually deducted and condition A or B is met. In this regulation and Reg 72 A and B, the deductible amount is the amount which the employer was liable to deduct from relevant payments made to an employee in a tax period. The amount actually deducted is the amount actually deducted by the employer from the relevant payments made to that employee during that period. So it, again, it's common ground that this regulation does not arise in this case. It's also important to emphasize, my lady and my lords, that this regulation has nothing to do with the situation where the employer has deducted the tax, but has failed to pass it on. This is about a failure to deduct in the first place. But as I say, Regulation 72 doesn't apply in this case because it's common ground that there was no deductible amount. And if anything, the obligation on the end users was to account. But just for the sake of completeness, if we look at what happens when one is in a deduction situation, the direction can be made when either condition A or B is met, just focusing on condition A. Condition A is that the employer satisfies the revenue, that the employer took reasonable care to comply, and that the failure to deduct the excess was, met, was due to an error in good faith. Um, <coughs> with respect, those conditions are entirely inconsistent with Mr. Mullen's ground of challenge, paragraph 39, that the knowledge of the employer is irrelevant. How can you judge whether a employer has taken reasonable care without examining the knowledge of the employer? Then briefly- Yeah, you're talking about the end user when you say employer. I do. In, in, in most cases, my lady, these regulations will apply to what might, one might call actual employers. Yes. 
But in this context, yeah. uh, if, if, if there had been an obligation to deduct, it would have been an obligation of a deemed employer. Um, then very briefly, um, Regulation 72F gives the power to make directions when the conditions in Regulation 72E apply. But again, it's common ground that 72E does not apply. We can see that from 309. 309 subsection 72 capital E subsection 1 or subregulation 1. Regulation 72F applies where an employee has received a relevant payment. It appears to HMRC that an amount intended to represent tax on the payment has been self-assessed or has not been self-assessed but has been paid under 59A. Um, which, by the way, shows that payment under 59A and self-assessment are not the same thing. But putting that point for later, um, we're not in that territory because um, uh, the amounts in question were not self-assessed by Mr. Hoey or any of the other claimants in this case. We're not in 72 E and F territory. We then turn to regulations 80 and 81. I just want to make a number of preliminary observations about the scope of the regulation. It starts at page 315. This regulation applies if it appears to HMRC that there may be tax payable for a tax year under regulation 68 by an employer which has neither been paid to HMRC nor certified. HMRC may determine the amount of that tax to the best of their judgment and serve notice of their determination on the employer. So just pausing there, Regulation 80 can cover any of the following situations. First, where the employer has not deducted the tax from the earnings before paying those earnings to the employee. Second, where the employer has deducted the tax but has not paid it over to the revenue. Third, where the employer has made notional payments of PAYE but has not accounted for and then paid the tax on that notional payment. Um, I'm going to turn to Regulation 81 in a moment, but before I do, and at the risk of repeating an earlier complaint, um, there is an inconsistency in Mr. Mullen's written case. In some parts of his skeleton, he suggests that the revenue should have made Regulation 80 determinations against the end users and collected the tax from then and have done no more. That's what he said in paragraph 20 of his skeleton. That seems to ally with his confused assertion that the liability ultimately is that of the employer. Elsewhere in his skeleton, see, for example, paragraph 46, and I think this emerged in his oral submissions yesterday, Mr. Mullen accepted that it would have been permissible for the revenue then to make the Regulation 81 determination, and that his case boils down to saying that the Regulation 8081 route was the only appropriate way to collect from the claimants. With all that in mind, can I now turn back to the reasons why HMRC considered it was not appropriate for them to seek to collect the tax from the end users under Regulation 80, and therefore why it was not appropriate to use 
the Reg 81 route subsequently to collect from the claimants. First, and before one gets to the main issues, it is worth noting that apart from Mr. Hoey, who supplied the name of his end users, not in his self-assessment return, but in 2015, in the course of the litigation, HMRC did not even know who the end users were for any of the claimants. Those end users were not identified in any self-assessment return by the claimants, including Mr. Hoey. And we can see that from the JR bundle at pages 109 to 114. Let me just look, look at that for a moment. I'm afraid is not very clear but um, I'm going to show you a number of examples of template questionnaires that were sent out to caseworkers who were compiling information relevant to the exercise of the discretion by in relation to each of the claimants so if you look at 109 so this this is this is exhibited was... to Mr. McFarlane's first witness statement he, and who drew it up who drew up this table well, the, the, the answers given in the table were given by the individual caseworkers, as Mr. McFarlane explained. Oh, OK. Um, so if one looks at the top, section, the, the text is very small, I'm sorry. Section 684, review template. Name of a reviewer, Carol Harrison, that's an officer. Um, the name of the claimant is in the top row third column, Mr. Andrew Chambers. There's a description of the scheme arrangement in the next big box. And then one, two, three, four rows down, self-assessment return, P14 data, etc. Name of end user, unknown. And that's the same for each of the other claimants all the way through to page 114. Well, there would be nowhere on the self-assessment form to declare who the end user is. Um, as Miss Nathan reminds me, there's the white space, which is like any other information you want to give us. But yes. obviously, they didn't want to give the names. But anyway, that's that's by the by. Um, so that's the first practical difficulty. I accept that if the commissioners had known who the end users were and had they unpacked the tax avoidance scheme in principle and subject to time limits they could have issued regulation 80 determinations could not had to could have issued regulation 80 determinations against all these end users but I just then want to follow through what would have happened the end users would have had a right of appeal under regulation 80 sub paragraph 5. If that appeal was exercised and dismissed or not appealed by, by when the regulation 80 determinations would have become quote final and conclusive then HMRC could have issued a direction under Regulation 81. You can just look at Regulation 81 back in the legislation bundle, page 319. 81.1a, this regulation applies if any part of the tax determined under Reg 80 is not paid within 30 days from the date on which the determination became final and conclusive. Now, um, as you know, Mr Mullen says this is the only way 
in which the power could be exercised to recover from the employee the tax which is undoubtedly his. But there is, of course, no mandatory duty anywhere, including in Regulation 81, to use this power. We see that from Regulation 81.4, that even where conditions A and B are met, a the inland B. revenue a may or direct. A or B. A or B. Yeah. Even where A or B is met, the inland revenue may direct that the employer is not liable to pay the amount of tax which appears to them should have been but was not deducted or accounted for. There's no mandatory obligation to use this either in the words of Reg 81 or anywhere else. So one then asks rhetorically, would it have been appropriate for the revenue to make end users go through all these hurdles just to get the money from the claimants? Let's just think about it. The end user faced with a Reg 80 determination would almost certainly have said, hold on, we were dealing with a UK agency. We were never told that Mr. Hoey's contractual employer was offshore. We had no idea that section 689 potentially applied to make us a deemed employer. We were not told that part of the money we were paying up the chain was ending up as a non repayable or indeed repayable loan to Mr. Hoey, nor were we told that the offshore employer was voluntarily operating PAYE on a salary element, but not on the loan element, nor were we told that any tax in respect of the loan amounts, if there was any, wasn't being paid by Mr. Hoey or anybody else. It would have come as a with respect, a complete shock to them to receive a Regulation 80 determination. Indeed, if the end... My Lord, um, I hesitate to... Or my lady, I hesitate to interrupt. But on several occasions, my learned friend is giving evidence of, about what the end users knew. Um, that's obviously a matter of some dispute between the parties. Um, and we don't accept for a second that the end users necessarily didn't know anything. And in fact, the only evidence we have of that is from the two witness statements, um, which say that in some cases they did know stuff. Well, not, not our end users. We've got no evidence about the end users in this case. Yeah, but we've, but we've got no evidence Pi either Pirey way. and Mighty That's North it. Hertfordshire or whatever they are. I accept that. We'll, we've got no evidence either way. At all. And if I, what we do friend, have, however, sorry. is the supplier agreement. Um, yes, but which doesn't tell us anything about what... I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, uh, um, up to learn a friend what he wants to say about that in reply, I didn't hear from him just now any explanation why, if the claimants had told their end users anything, they wouldn't have filed witness statements in these proceedings. The burden is on them in the appeals, the burden is on them in the JR. If they want to, if they want to say the revenue manifestly got it wrong, were irrational in concluding that the end users knew nothing, why on earth would they not have filed witness statements, with or without, hopefully with, contemporaneous supporting documentation saying, this is what I told my end users. Indeed, if the end users had then contacted Mr. Hoey, and assuming Mr. Hoey would have been able to tell them anything, and that's a point that my friend Miss Nathan will come back to when she shows you parts of the transcript in the FTT where it was clear that Mr. Hoey knew very little indeed about what was really going on in terms of the contractual chain. And that is evidence that's before the court. They would presumably have been told, at least prior to Rangers, oh, well, we voluntarily operated. We're, we're, yes, we're offshore, but we voluntarily operated PAYE, and tax has been paid on the salary element. And there's, you don't need to worry. There's no tax to pay on the loan, so you should appeal the Regulation 80 determination. Now, of course, any such Regulation 80 appeal would have failed following Rangers. So then what would have happened? Well, either HMRC could then have made Regulation 81 determination, or they might not have done, uh, um, in, in which case they would have had the money from the, end from the end users, but the end users would then have had a cast iron restitution claim against the employees. But in either event, ultimately, the economic burden would have rested where it belonged, namely with the employees. But why, 
I ask rhetorically, must it have been appropriate, still less mandatory, for the Crown to go through that whole process? And more importantly, why was it appropriate to make the end users go through all of that? In our submission, it was obviously not mandatory to do that. That's what the legislation says. And it was plainly rational for the revenue to reach the view that instead, the em deemed employer, the end user, should not have been expected to comply with the regulations in the first place, and, and thereby to exercise the 6847AB power. Can I then deal with the suggestion um, by Mr. Mullen that the real reason the 7A power was exercised in this case was because the revenue were out of time to issue Reg 80 determinations? Um, first, as I said in opening, the TMA time limits associated with the making of a Reg 80 determination are there to protect the employer who has received the Reg 80 determination. So as I said at the beginning, what Mr. Mullen is seeking to do is to take advantage of the Reg 80 time limits for the protection of the employer and instead seek to inure them for the benefit of the claimants who were employees, even though the claimant specific time limits under the TMA have been complied with. Second, the suggestion that the real reason the 7A power was exercised was because the Crown was out of time to issue Reg 80 determinations is inconsistent with the revenues case. And I'm not for a second conceding that even if that had been the reason, that would have been improper, but that isn't, as we see from the evidence, the reason. Um, Mr. Mullen took you yesterday to the CIP internal guidance note. We saw that at pages 35 to 40 of the JR bundle. Um, the key point is that nowhere in that guidance does it say or suggest that you should deal with, uh, you should use a 7A power to deal with a situation where actually you really think it's the employer who should be paying up through its collection obligation, but you're out of time. So as a device, as a way around that problem, you're going to uh, um, exercise your 7A power. That's nowhere suggested in the internal guidance. And the same point falls to be made perhaps even more strongly by reference to the avoidance handling process manual. We can just look at that. There's one page we haven't yet seen, I don't think. JR Bundle, um, the index to the relevant bits of the manual are at page 92 and following. I beg your pardon, 91 and following. Can I just allay a fear that um, my lady and my lords might have had, um, that I had when I looked at this? I, I went through um, each page of this AHP internal manual and thought, well, there must be something between the odd, the, the, the even numbered paragraphs, but actually there isn't. I'm told that it's. Um, it's an even numbered paragraph to account for the possibility you might later want to insert separate paragraphs. But this is the complete set of provisions. And with that in mind, could you look please at page 101? Headed PAYE regs, section 6847 ABIT per PAYE regs and contractor loan schemes. 7AB and Regulation 80. While HMRC regularly litigates on alternative bases, using 7AB and Reg 80 determinations in relation to the same income may lead to uncertainty <laughs> over who the revenue intends to recover tax from and uncertainty about how the revenue views compliance with the PAYE regulations. HMRC may wish to consider issuing Reg 80 determinations in the alternative after a decision has been made to exercise the 7AB discretion particularly where a case is expected to lead to litigation, where the end 
client's identity is known or could easily be discovered, and if it's considered appropriate to protect the exchequer in the event of a court disagreeing with the use of 6847AB. This should be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. HMRC may also wish to consider using the 7AB discretion in the alternative where a Reg 80 determination has been issued, if again, essentially on the same basis. So not, we're going to use this to get around difficult time limits uh, um, for the protection of the employer. But as I say, even if that had been their purpose, um, that would not have been an improper one, but it wasn't. Um, so that completes what I want to say about why it was considered appropriate to use the 7A power in these cases rather than any of the specific powers in the regulations. And the next topic I was going to turn to um, is the retrospectivity heading. Do you think you can complete that or make a decent start in the next seven minutes? Um, Maybe not complete. Well, I certainly won't complete it, but I can make a good start. Um, Mr. Mullen, under this heading, said he relied both on the presumption against retrospectivity and on the language of the section. Can I start with the presumption against retrospectivity and whether it operates in this case? The principles are set out in a judgment of this court called Ben Nevis Holdings and HMRC, Authorities Bundle, tab 36, judgment of Lord Justice Lloyd-Jones as he then was. I'm sorry, we, we supplied the, the Simon's Tax Cases PDF, but somehow it's, it's a HTML version that's gone into the bundle. Can I pick it up, please, starting in the judgment of Lord Justice Lloyd-Jones at page 895 of the bundle. Could I just invite you to save my voice in your is to read the whole of 48, including the indented passage from Benin at the bottom. I'm sorry, I'm stuck on this here. Where are we starting? Eight, page 895 of the bundle. I'm just inviting my lords and my lady to read all of paragraph 48. Thank you. The sentence I'd particularly uh, highlight is the first indented sentence by the lower hole punch. It is important to grasp the true nature of objectionable retrospectivity, which is that the legal effect of an act or omission is retroactively altered by a later change in the law. Uh, one of the submissions I'm going to make is that there has been no change in the law retroactively altering the effect of an act or omission. And then over the page, please. Um, in the middle of the page, there's a passage that starts Lord Roger. Um, this is Lord Roger in the Wilson case, the citation for which is at the top of the page. Lord Roger then observed that the presumption more often falls to be considered in relation to legislation which alters rights only for the future, and that since it's more likely that Parliament intended to alter vested rights in this way than it intended to make a retroactive change in practice, the presumption against legislation altering vested rights is regarded as weaker than the presumption against legislation having retroactive effect. It's far from clear that the, on the authorities what constitutes a vested right for this purpose. 
Lord Roger and Wilson observing that the courts have tended to attach a somewhat woolly label vested to those rights which they conclude should be protected from the effect of new legislation. What is clear, however, is that the basis of any presumption in this area is that of simple fairness. Thus, in Wilson, Lord Nichols approved the following statement by Lord Justice Stoughton in Tunnicliffe as stating the underlying rationale of the principle. If my lady and my lords could read the whole of that indented passage, starting with the true principle. And then just for the sake of completeness, Lord Justice Jackson agreed, didn't add anything on those matters, and Lord Justice Floyd agreed as well. Um, applying those principles, we would submit there is nothing at all objectionable about interpreting the 7A power so as to allow the credit in Regulation 185 and 188 to be um, removed. First of all, this is obviously not a case, as I said before, in which new legislation enacted after the relevant events alters the legal consequences of those events, because 7A was enacted in July 2003, before the regulations were even made. Secondly, it cannot be said that in Mr. Hoey's case, there was any unfair deprivation of a vested or accrued right to a credit at all. And that's going to take me to a number of points on statutory interpretation, and I suspect better done tomorrow morning than now. Starting at 9.30 tomorrow? Tomorrow we're starting at 9.30. Thank you uh, all for agreeing to that. We'll, we'll have um, appropriate breaks. <laughs>